Welcome back AP Chemistry students to Unit 8, Acid-Based Chemistry. Today we will be talking about Unit 8.5, Titration Curve. Titrations are a procedure in chemistry which we use to determine the concentration of an acid or a base. Largely, they are done on paper. We calculate when the amount of acid equals the amount of base, and in lab, we are able to do titrations relatively swiftly. However, in this lecture, we are going to talk about titration curves, which carry out this procedure very slowly, showing the pH as you drop by drop add the titrant. So these curves pra in practicality are a slow going procedure, but we are going to focus first on the calculation part, which is theoretical. And then we'll talk about the experimental part, what you would do in lab in this unit. So remember that when an acid and a base react, they always produce the same products. They always produce water and some salt. So when an acid and a base interact, they neutralize one another. So the net ionic equation for an acid-base reaction is that the hydroxide and the hydrogen ions produce water is a very simple one-to-one -one ratio. This is the reaction that occurs when an acid and a base interact. So when the amount of base is equal to the amount of acid, they have neutralized one another. And we can take advantage of this to figure out how much base you have or how much acid there is. In a titration, we determine either the concentration of an unknown acid or base or how much of an uh, acid or base would be needed to neutralize its counterpart. So when the moles of acid equal the moles of base, they are neutralized. Now remember that you can determine the number of moles by taking the molarity, the number of moles for each liter of solution, and multiplying by the volume because that will give you how many moles you have. And so this formula is basically just, just using those units. The molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid has to equal the molarity of the base times the volume of the volume of the base, just paying attention to the stoichiometric coefficients of the base or the acid, meaning a polyprotic acid would have two hydrogens that could neutralize the hydroxide, or a monoprotic base would have one hydroxide to neutralize the acid. I have two different bases. In the first one, it takes 50 milliliters of half molar hydrochloric acid to neutralize 25 milliliters of the base. What is the molarity of the base? Remember, the molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid times the number of hydrogens has to equal the molarity of the base times the volume of the base times the number of hydroxides. So if I want the molarity of the base I would divide by the volume of the base and the number of hydroxides on both sides, giving me this formula. And then it's just a matter of realizing what you have. I have a volume of acid. I've got a molarity of acid. I have a volume of base. And I'm looking for the molarity of the base, as we said. So the molarity of the base is going to equal the molarity of the acid, 0.5 molar times the volume of the acid, 50 milliliters, divided by the volume of the base, 25 milliliters, times the number of hydroxides, which is one. <coughs> And, there has, and there's one hydrogen and hydrochloric acid. So 0 0.5 molar times 50 milliliters gives me 25 millimoles. 25 divided by 25 is one. Millis cancel out, moles for each liter is the molarity. So the molarity of the base is one molar. <laughs> 
What if I change the acid? Different base, and now it takes, now it takes 50 milliliters of 0.5 molar sulfuric acid. What is this new base's molarity? Again, the formula is the same. The molarity of the base is going to equal the molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid times the number of hydrogens. Sulfuric acid has two hydrogens it can use to neutralize the base. The volume of the base is staying 25 milliliters and it's still a monoprotic base. So 50 milliliters times 0.5 molarity gives me 25 millimoles, but with it being diprotic, this is, there are 50 millimoles worth of hydrogen that are neutralizing those hydroxides. So 50 divided by 25 is two milli cancels out. So this is two molar potassium hydroxide. So you do need to pay attention to those stoichiometric coefficients. How many hydrogens or how many hydroxides can neutralize its counterpart? These neutralizations are carried out through a procedure known as a titration normally. In a titration, we use a specialized piece of glassware called a burette. It's basically an upside down graduated cylinder that starts at zero and counts up to 50. And as you add your titrant, which is the thing in the burette, to your analytic, the thing in the flask, you are introducing either a base to an acid or an acid to a base. In the example here, we are introducing a base to an acid. Now, normally the titrant is what you know and the, and the analytic is what you are looking to measure, but you can go in either direction. When it comes to the burette, it's controlled by a small knob called a stopcock, which allows you to, allow, to add drop by drop your titrant to the analytic. And by taking the difference between the volume you start at and the volume you end at, you can determine the volume that you used. In this case, the volume of your base that you used by subtraction. The volume you start at minus the volume you ended at tells you how much base you added because your burette is almost never set at zero. You just continue to use the same titrant over and over again, doing the experiment multiple times. Because as the acid and the base interact, they will eventually reach their equivalency point where the moles of acid equal the moles of base. And if it's a strong acid with a strong base, they will neutralize one another. Now you know whether it is an acid or a base or neutral by using an indicator of some sort. Indicators are special compounds that change their way they refract light based on the amount of hydrogen ions. So they change color is a fancy way of doing it. Now the indicator you are probably most com you're most familiar with is from eighth grade litmus paper, right? Litmus paper is pink or red in an acid and blue in a base. But putting paper into your flask is not overtly helpful. So most of the time in this course, we'll use phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein is clear in an acid, but in a base, it's this neon pink color that you see here. So I would say that this reaction is probably past the equivalency point because at this point, we have a basic solution if there's phenolphthalein in that flask because that color red, because that color pink is normally about the color that phenolphthalein turns. There are other indicators that you could utilize. For the most part, we will stick with phenolphthalein because it changes color at a pH of about seven. Other indicators change color at different pHs and you would use them if the equivalency point doesn't happen at a pH of seven. If there's not a strong acid and a strong base neutralizing one another, we're not gonna come to an equivalency point at seven because of the salts that they produce but that's a story for later. So you can practice your titration calculations on page 23 of your packet.
Remember for page 23 that the formula is that the number of hydrogens times the molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid has to equal the molarity of the base times the volume of the base times the number of hydroxides in that base. Or that the moles of that the moles of acid have to equal the moles of base. So with that being said, pause the video and complete page 23 in your packet. Titration curves, as I said, is when we add the titrant to our analytic drop by drop. And we'll look something like this. At the beginning of our titration, we'll have a pH that stays relatively level until we have added enough of the titrant that the solution flips, that it goes from being an acid to being a base, as is the case here. So here we have a strong acid being neutralized by a strong base, they flipped, or where a base becomes an acid. When you have a strong acid neutralizing a weak acid, their pH at the equivalency point is going to be approximately seven. Or when a weak acid and a weak base neutralize one another, their pH is approximately seven because remember that in a neutralization reaction, we reach the equivalency point when the moles of acid is equal to the moles of base, but it's also equal to the moles of salt. And it's that salt that has a pH of seven. Neutral salts keep that pH at neutral seven. But with a weak acid being titrated by a strong base, that would produce a basic salt. And their equivalency point will have a pH above seven. A weak acid with a strong base, the strong base wins that tug of war of the hydrolysis and the salt that's produced ends up being a basic salt. So the solution that's produced from this neutralization has a pH above seven. So another thing to point out in a titration curve between a weak acid and a strong base is that you'll notice a little tail at the beginning. A weak acid when mixed with a strong base will show a big jump as that weak acid neutralizes the base or a sizable jump at first. You'll see a bit of a jump in the pH and then it will level out because once it levels out, you've created what's known as a buffer. A buffer is a solution that's resistant to pH change that has an acid present, but it also has a base present, the conjugate base of that weak acid that can neutralize the addition of more base because the weak acid is there to catch it or can neutralize an acid because the conjugate base is present to neutralize any more acid. So buffers are a system of their own that are formed from a weak acid or base and its conjugate base or acid. And we're going to talk about buffers a lot in the next subunit, but for right now just know that this region of a titration curve is known as the buffer zone. And the solution is most resistant to change at the geographic middle of that zone. So between the equivalency point and the beginning of that and the end of that tail, this whole zone here is known as the buffer zone and it's most resistant to change at the middle of that buffer zone. You reach the equivalency point when the moles of acid equal the moles of base. You can see it on the graph as the geographic middle. You can think of it on the graph as the geographic middle between when it curves up and when it flattens out again. So for this graph, it's somewhere in this region. <clears throat> that equivalency point is when the moles of acid equal the moles of base. 
So that last graph was a picture of a weak acid, starts with a low pH and rises, being neutralized by a strong base. In a weak base being neutralized by a strong acid, it would look like this. Again, you see that little curve lays flat as we enter the buffer zone. We reach the equivalency point and then it flips to being an acidic solution. So again, that equivalency point is that geographic middle between when it starts to flip and when it has flipped completely. So for this acid, it has an equivalency point with a pH of approximately a 9. Now, another interesting note on a titration curve is at the half equivalency point. We reached the equivalency point on this graph when 10 milliliters of base was added. The half equivalency point would be somewhere around 5 milliliters. At that point, at the half equivalency point, your pH at the half equivalency point is equal mathematically to the pKa. It's this neat little trick that you can utilize to actually determine or have a good idea what an unknown acid might be. If we neutralize an unknown acid with a base and we discover what the half equivalency point is, this will give us an idea of what the Ka is. <laughs> If you're doing a titration of a polyprotic acid or base, you will actually end up with multiple curves. The first one being when that first hydrogen ion or hydroxide is released, so something for example of sulfuric acid. This is when that first hydrogen ion leaves the bisulfate anion. And then you have a second equivalency point when the second hydrogen ion leaves the sulfate ion. So polyprotic and poly, polyprotic acids and bases have multiple curves within a single titration. Most of the time you'll focus on one of them. Most of the time we'll focus on the first one. But just be aware that they do exist. They'll have different equivalency points and different half equivalency points, therefore different Ka's and different pKa's. So how do you know what to utilize? What indicator? You pick an indicator whose pKa is close to the pH at the equivalency point. So if we were going to do the titration of glycerin here, where we have this titration curve, glycerin's pH at the equivalency point is about 6. We would choose a, a, an indicator whose pKa was about 6. We would try to find one whose pKa would be something like 10 to the minus 5th or 10 to the minus 6th because that's going to bring us closest to that. So with that being said, we are done with titrations. Next class, we'll talk about that buffer zone in much greater detail when we cover buffers. I'll see you next time.